Well, welcome to another edition of TM3 Impact. My name is Tomas Martinez. We're in the TM3 studios. And listen, I have a very special guest, Jason Glass with the Phyllis Browning Company. Super excited to have you on TM3 Impact, my friend. I'm glad you're here, Jason. Uh, Tomas, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I can't wait to do this. Yeah, so we were, we were just talking and it, we were having that conversation. I was like... That gummit, we should have recorded what we were doing over in the next room. I mean, that was awesome. Well, let's try to do it right now. We so. got to do it now. Yeah. We got to do it now. So we always start out is, Jason, tell me your San Antonio story. And I always call it like the cliff note version. Like, how did you come to live in this amazing city? Absolutely. So short version is my mother and her husband moved here after I graduated high school in Dallas and they were looking for, you know, a large hill country spread and they finally found one in Bernie. And my wife and I at the time were living in Atlanta. We didn't have kids yet. And my mom just started absolutely working us to come back to Texas. You know, y'all need to start a family, come back to Texas. And we were interested, but not willing to leave Atlanta. We were enjoying living there. But then 9-11 happened. And I was working for CNN and, you know, that day it started off with, is that a private plane? What's going on? And then within hours, because people end up, you know, making it about themselves within hours, everyone at CNN thought, are we a potential target? And everybody just left except for people who were on air. And that day, I know it changed a lot of people and it definitely changed us. So after that, we were definitely ready to come back to Texas. Okay. And so we decided to, you know, we looked at Dallas where we looked, where we grew up. Yeah. And then we came and we visited my mom and we just decided, you know, let's try something different. It's beautiful here and yeah. let's just see what happens. And so that's, you know, that's how we ended up here. So, so that's really interesting. I didn't know the nine 11 connection. So you're in Atlanta, 9-11 happens, and that was when you kind of said, okay, maybe we should really consider this. Big time. It, That's when you it was, you know, that next day, we just said, let's get really serious about this. Let's wow. get serious about leaving somewhere where we didn't have any family to yeah. go be around family again. Yeah. And so how, what, how, what was the, the time uh, table uh, before moving oh, from 9-11? It was probably two or three months. Oh, wow. Okay. It was quick. That's real quick. Easy to sell your home. No issues selling and then moving, you know, absolutely not. It was difficult. We had purchased this new loft project and a little bit of a transition in the neighborhood. And oh, no. I'm looking back and I remember I thought our realtor was not good. Yeah. And I can remember him clearly. His name was jazz, jazz. and, <laughs> and jazz, <laughs> Jazz had a history of selling, you know, lofts and condos right. in Midtown Atlanta. But still, I can remember being so frustrated with him. And, man, I just want to see a contract. No more excuses. And right. kind of funny how, you know, not very long after that, you know, I got it from the other side, you know. Wow. So it took you a while to sell it then? Yes. It took you a while. Absolutely. Oh. It wasn't a, that was not a hot market uh, at all back then. Yeah. And, and so that's interesting. Okay. So now. You move to San Antonio, you get here. So let, but, but I want to, I always like to go back. Cause I always like, I always, I'm very fascinated uh, having conversation with, you know, successful people, very successful in what you do as an agent in San Antonio and everything. And, and so I'm always curious, what, what was 16 year old Jason? What, what was that guy like growing up? I know you were big into sports. Yeah, that was a really interesting year in my life. It was a year where things changed for me. Uh, I was going to uh, what is usually ranked as the top school in Texas, which is St. Mark's in Dallas. And, but I, I really didn't have a lot of good things going on there. I was not a great student, and I was really into sports, but I was overweight. And I really had never had success on any of the school teams, and I was very frustrated by that. Um, but that year, I did lose some weight over the summer. Okay. And so I did feel different. I was more physically fit, but I remember I was on the junior varsity basketball team and I still had never, ever started a game. The most points I'd ever scored in a game was five. Yeah. Well, we finally had this game where the guy who was playing in front of me, who's still a good friend of mine today, he was sick. And so this game, my coach said, glass, you're starting. And I could not believe it. I just, 
I was overwhelmed. You were 16 at this time? I, I was 15. 15. I was, yeah, okay. I was, yeah, 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 yeah. I was about yeah. three weeks from turning 16. I love it. So I was 15 years old, and I was getting to start my first game. And it was against one of our rival schools. And I scored 30 points in that game. That's so awesome. And I love it. I That changed me. Yeah. Mostly for good. Yeah. But I did have people all of a sudden start treating me very differently. Yeah. The boys on the varsity team, you know, were all of a sudden just so happy for me. And, you know, people really were patting me on the back, which I wasn't used to. Right. And, you know, that that led to me having an identity yeah. where I was good at sports. And so by the time I was a senior, I was the co-captain of the basketball team and the baseball team. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I still look back on that and knowing that, you know, I I was a late bloomer. So I wasn't one of the kids where when I was little, everybody thought, oh, this, this kid's a great athlete or amazing. Yeah. I did have to work for it. And then it, but it happened so quickly, almost like overnight success. Yeah. And, you know, it became a little bit of my identity. Yeah. And it's funny because then you can get a little cocky. Like people yeah. start treating you like something, you know, it all came so fast where I think most people, you know, they have more of a consistent path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, that became a little bit of a trend in my life. But uh, I put all my time into sports because a lot of my classmates, I mean, they're, they're literally rocket scientists. Right. These are some literally. of the most. Yeah. <laughs> And so, I <laughs> you know, I just kind of said, okay, that's the usual identity. Yeah. I'm going to try to just do something different. But that made me not such a great student. Right. Well, listen, let me – so I, I'm right there with you, Jason. I was not a good student at all, right? That was not my jam. Schoolwork was not my jam. And, and I, I guarantee you if any of my teachers found out that I actually became a teacher, they were probably <laughs> really concerned. <laughs> Because I really struggled. Okay, so, so you know, then, you know, you get to your senior, and then tell me about the transition going from that to UT. You end up going to UT. Well, I didn't go straight there because I couldn't get in. Yeah. And, and at the school I was at, I mean, that was, that was a little bit shameful. So I did have fun in high school, and I put all my time into sports, but it, when it came time to go into colleges, all my friends were going to elite colleges, and, you know, it... it at worst, they were going to UT and yeah. I couldn't even get in. So that was difficult for me. And I had to really think about, did I spend my time wisely? Am I dumb? Am I a dumb person? I had yeah. to think that because it was so different. So I ended up going to the University of Arizona in Tucson for three weeks. Okay. And only three weeks, three weeks. <laughs> and I was very homesick and it was a little bit of a party school and the yeah. group that I was supposed to kind of identify with a uh, fraternity. I just felt like this is just going to be a party thing and this is not what I want to do right now. Yeah. So I went back to Dallas and that was some more shame that I had to deal with. Wow. And yeah. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to play baseball, but I was not a division one player. So I went back home. I got a job as a waiter, okay. and no one knew me, and I I was a little embarrassed. Where'd you, wait, where'd you wait tables at? This was at Dalt's Grill oh, in Dallas, it. and, you know, love that it. was a place where you had to make hand-spun milkshakes and, you know, at brunch, and it was a difficult job oh, yeah. because, you know, I learned a lot, and I learned to get out of my little bubble, and all this time, I started researching other places I could go to university. Okay. And uh, Division Three uh, baseball and things like that, and I had my high school coach write me letters, and so I finally decided to go to a place called St. Lawrence University, okay. which is on the Ontario, New York border. Whoa. The closest city is Ottawa, Ontario. Oh, my gosh. And I don't know this story. Yeah, and it's... I mean, it's cold, I bet. like it is cold and, you know, a tiny little place in the middle of uh, the New York Canadian border on farmland. Wow. And that was another place where nobody knew me. Yeah. Mostly everybody knew each other because they had all gone to schools in the Northeast and they knew each other. They were not used to anyone from Texas. Right. So they, you, they probably thought you rode a horse, right? They did. You, you rode a horse. They yes. did. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, oh, so, funny. but what I did was I reinvented myself there. Ah. I became an intense student. Academics ah. was just huge for me. So 
I just said, I'm changing myself. I was not proud of who I was as a student before. So I'm throwing myself all into it. How did you, what, what okay, that's a mindset, right? So this is. is really interesting because, you know, I like to do, I like to talk a lot about mindset. What, how were you able to change the mindset and tell me like maybe two things that you specifically did to flip that switch? Absolutely. Well, number one was going to a place where no one knew me. Ah. So I felt I could start with a clean slate. Okay. And that was very, very helpful. And the other thing, which I don't know how positive it always is, but I did feel shame that all my friends were, you know, at these amazing colleges and seemingly having an amazing time. And here I was, you know, kind of a dropout. And then, you know, I just felt I had something to prove. You had something to prove. I, I love really it. did. I love it. But that's a good place to be in a sense of motivation. Absolutely. Right? A hundred percent. If you can use that as a positive motivation and it, it, and it won't crush your spirit. Right. But, right. you know, with sports teams, a lot of times their coach will go in and saying they're disrespecting us. Mm-hmm. You know, they wrote they wrote about you like this. And yeah. so they're trying to use that as you've got something to prove. You're going to show yeah. them. And I definitely felt that way. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, it was it, it changed my life completely. And yeah. I think that was a very small school. We had 500 people in our class. OK, but I was ranked number two out of 500 people in, for, in college, in college, wow. in that class. However, that's awesome. It was it was cold. Yeah, it was and, <laughs> The idea that I had now put down grades to be able to transfer to the University of Texas where my parents had gone. Okay. That was powerful. Okay. And so I did transfer to UT for my last two years. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. But but going somewhere where no you could re, kind of recreate your identity and then using that kind of like that motivation to say, I've got something to prove, using that as well. That's powerful, Jason. I love it. And we kind of did that in San Antonio also. Okay. If we talk all the time, yeah. why didn't we just go back to Dallas where everybody knew us? Yeah. Well, I, my wife was on the same page. We, we were not afraid to start over and meet new people and do new things and try to break out of the usual. Right. And, you know, so it's so, a good thing we did. I'm glad you mentioned your wife, Cat, uh, right? Uh, and, and because I'm a firm believer, like, who you marry matters, right? Like, you, you, know, for, you know, people that are listening, who you marry is really, really important. How did you and your wife, I don't know that story, how y'all met. We actually met at UT, and um, you know, I I saw her in a summer school class, but I didn't speak to her, yeah. uh, which you know, it was just I actually had regret about that. But then, thankfully, one of my best friends from high school, he had a popular band at UT, and they always played under the tower every Tuesday afternoon, and yeah. you know, and then one day I saw her at that show, and then. You know, I was thinking, well, maybe I should talk to her. I don't know if I'm going to. Right. And then my big break was that my friend started dating Kat's best friend. Oh, and so, but I, I, it's a true story, though. It took me about six years from that point yeah. to get a date. Oh, my her. goodness. Yeah. Now, was she? Was it because you didn't want to ask or was she playing hard to get? Well, she had, <laughs> she had boyfriends oh, and, you, you know, okay. I, had, I had different girlfriends, but, you know. There was something there. Yeah. So there was a little perseverance with that. And so how long, so you guys ended ended up uh, dating in college while you were still in school or afterwards? No, it was afterwards. After, it was after law school actually. Ah, interesting. So years later. Interesting. Yeah, but we would keep in touch. She moved from Washington, D.C. to Telluride, Colorado, and she would, you know, send postcards to her entire contact book saying, hey, come visit me, smiley face, and I took that literally, so. I'm on my way. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. That's, that's right. a smart man. And how long have y'all been married now? 21 years. Dude. So you got married in 99. Correct. Christina and I got married in 99. All right. Wait, what month? July 3rd. In July? Okay, so we're December. Okay, that was yeah. much smarter. We got married outside in Dallas on July 3rd. Were you melting? We were melting. We also yeah. had, you know, those cool tech fans on the sidelines of yes. NFL games? Yes. We literally had those set up. <laughs> With the, with the water hose connected so it gives the mist. <laughs> mist. And uh, I love it. We gave out these custom fans so of people course. were fanning themselves. And oh, that's awesome. It wasn't a very long ceremony because we didn't want yeah. anybody to, we didn't want to lose Smart. anybody there. 
Yeah, because somebody could pass out. You oh. could have somebody in your like, you know, your your groomsmen. You could you could easily have somebody pass out. One hundred percent. That's awesome. Well, congratulate. Twenty one years is a beautiful thing. Yeah. It, I mean, it's awesome. I love being married, and I love telling people I've been married for twenty one years. Absolutely. You know, so that that's really cool. Okay, so now we you're in San Antonio. We're gonna fast forward. You go to UT Law. I'm just curious. What was UT Law like? It was it was challenging for me because I went when I was twenty two and. Probably the average age was a little bit, most people have had a little bit of life experience and I felt very fortunate to be there. Yeah. I did. I've, I was, I was literally happy to be there. Okay. I felt that I had proved something yeah. and, but when I got there and I saw people, we had three doctors in our class. We, we had lots of people that already had children. We, people were far more mature and focused than I was. So I think I did kind of slip back into, all right, maybe this isn't for me. Mm. And I can't say that I was as focused academically as many of my classmates, yeah. but I did kind of find a track, which was sports law. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a real estate attorney, but then he got a uh, specialty doing sports law as well. I didn't know that. Yeah. So okay. like he was the last attorney for the Southwest conference before it went away. Okay. And he represented him at Smith on uh, actually several real estate transactions. Very um, cool. So I, I did kind of put myself into that. So I was president of the entertainment and sports law society at UT law and okay. was kind of focused on, okay, what can I do with that? Uh, yeah. Jerry Maguire came out right around that time. Great movie. Absolutely great, great movie. movie. And I mean, that, you know, the um, the person that was largely based on was Lee Steinberg, yeah. who's, you know, an agent who I got to meet years later through oh. my job at Turner. Okay. Super nice guy. And um, but I actually got to talk to this really young attorney who was a sports agent for IMG okay. in Cleveland, Ohio. And he had recently signed a young golfer oh, named Tiger stop Woods. It. So I was talking to this guy named Mike, uh, Mark Steinberg. And yeah. so Steinberg gave me some ideas about, okay, how do you go from law school into kind of following in his footsteps? Yeah. And, you know, there was internships or, you know, he suggested Ohio University's sports management master's program. Okay. So I did it. I, that's, that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. Um, is I went to Ohio and it was at that time just a one year program and it was all about practical experience and connections. Whoa. The that's perfect. It was so perfect because the academic work was nothing. Yeah. And they also, they paid you to go there. Everybody had uh, graduate assistantships and mine was wow. communications. So I wrote the newsletter and yeah, you know, things like that. Um, so that was a wonderful experience in a beautiful little college town called Athens, Ohio. Yeah, okay. Now, does, now is that how you got the connection to the WCW and yes, Turner? Yes. How did that connection happen? So Ohio University Sports Management Program had many people that had gone to Turner Broadcasting in Atlanta okay. afterwards. So they definitely had a pipeline. And uh. so, you know, they had a few jobs open. And I was definitely not interested in Ted Turner's pro wrestling company, right. WCW. <laughs> like, I didn't really know anything about pro wrestling, but right. they had a communications job open. And I thought, all right, I'll take this job and then I will work my way into, uh, you know, the NBA on TNT and hanging out with Charles Barkley and all that stuff. Money. I just thought I'm going to get in there. Yeah. And. So I did. I got that job, and that was 99. Yeah. And That was the year you got married. year I got married. So we got married on July 3rd, and I think uh, we went to Atlanta on July 19th. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, and started the job right started there. Started the there. job right there. Okay. And, you know, my boss had been there for quite a while. And now I look back on it, and he was a little bit checked out, as if he had a little PTSD. Oh. Um and I, I did figure out why after a little bit, yeah. but it was, my job was to go on the road with the pro wrestlers and you would go to, um, ticket sale events. So I remember the first one I ever did was with macho man, Randy Savage. Oh. I had to pick him up in a limousine, order all that. And we flew to Minneapolis from Atlanta and we spent the most of the day at the target center in Minneapolis. Yeah promoting the ticket sales for our future event there. And, you know, that was that day. I should have known what I was in for because my boss said, Jason, it's so important that, you know, and he always called the wrestlers, the boys, you need to know, you need to know what type of beer 
the boys like? Do they like Miller Lite, Coors Light? Because when, you know, you're going to get them in this limo and you need to have their brand of beer. And if you screw this up, I promise you that it's going to be a problem. Okay. So my very first deal, I'm with Macho Man, who was one of the few guys that I knew. Okay. Because he was he was pretty darn famous. The Slim Jim commercials, if yep. you remember those. He was, he was in Spider-Man, the movie. And so my boss said, Mach likes Miller Lite. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I am super nervous and always. And so I order the limousine. It gets me first. We show up at his mansion and the northern suburbs of Atlanta, and I've got the Miller light there and just praying. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Macho Man comes out, and he was a man that lived his gimmick. So the way he was on camera was the way he was Stop off camera. It. So he did not dress differently or act differently. And you'll, a lot of the most famous wrestlers, that, that's one of the reasons. They, are, they live their gimmick. They are wow. who they are on camera. <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't know that. And he had a... Uh, he had a very young girlfriend who was also a character on our show. Okay. And so I, right now, I mean, I'm as nervous as I've ever been in my life. And it's like, hello, Miss Macho, how are you doing? Yeah. Uh, fine, brother. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so, so funny. So they get in and he looks over at the Miller Lite. Brother, what's this? Uh, Miller Lite, uh, I would never drink Miller Lite. What the hell, brother? Starts screaming at me. And he's like, I don't know who you are, but you are done. And he gets on the phone and he literally dials the president of WCW. Oh my God. And he's like, Eric, this Jason guy, uh, I want him gone. I want him gone. And he's like, here, Eric wants to talk to you. And it was actually my boss, oh. Alan. And they had planned this little prank oh. and they got me. I mean, I was, I mean, and I don't even know how you even respond to that. Like, well, ah. it was intense anxiety going into peer relief. And then we yeah. had such an incredible fun day and yeah. I ended up, you know, liking macho man very, very much. He's a cool guy. He was such a good guy. That's he really cool. was, but you know, others were not. And, yeah. but I learned I'd say the most important sales skills I've ever learned on that job because I would have to get sometimes famous superstars to do things that they did not want to do. So I'd have to go up to Hulk Hogan and say, Hulk, they need you to do a live interview for the Cleveland Channel 5 News. And he'd say, brother, I don't do Cleveland. Oh, my God. Okay, okay, Hulk. And so I'd have to try to find a way to win. So I would say, but there's actually a Make-A-Wish Foundation kid who will meet you in the studio. And he'd say, fine, brother, you got me right where my heart is. And That's so I cool. learned, I would learn what, what their why was to actually do something. Yeah. And for a lot of the guys who could be very scary and difficult, yeah. they would be different around the kids. And, and I admired that in them. They, yeah. So I, after a while, I was like, you can scream at me all you want, but if I see the way that you are with children, yeah. that's everything. One day I was in, with Bill Goldberg, and Goldberg was probably our biggest star at the time, and uh, we were walking, I think, in New York somewhere for some convention, and all of a sudden he wasn't behind me. I looked back, and you know he was just peeling off three $100 bills to give to a homeless man in the street. Wow. So... I would see these acts of kindness that were much more important uh, for the people they gave them to. So it was okay, if, right. you know, in their uh, tension and everything, if they were a little bit tough with me. Well, you pretty much had to be that that guy that they had to point a lot of that probably frustration to during that time, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, and oh. yeah. But i i tried to I tried to change that. There have been a lot of balls that were dropped before I got there, and mm -hmm. I just said, you know, no more. Let's let's do this right. Yeah. And so, it was uh, it was such a good experience uh, to help kind of put me forward in life. But yeah. the full year that I was there, I was there parts of two other years. Yeah. We lost, I think, thirty five million dollars, oh and I did see this culture of unbelievable corporate excess, yeah. which I was a part of. They would give me a corporate credit card 
And after the shows, so I would have to go to the live shows, they would just say, yeah, you just buy the boys, whatever, buy the bar, buy the bar. So I'd I'd be submitting bills, you know, 11, $12,000, you know, for, for basically beer. (laughs) Wow. They wouldn't even drink the good stuff. No, it was just, I mean, it was just, it was a, it was a culture of excess that, you know, people who were, um, who worked there that, you know, they weren't we weren't necessarily caught up in that world. We, we thought, is this how it's supposed to be? And yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. So, you know, I could, we, we knew we were going to go out of business. And mm. so there was a, there was a legal job open at CNN, ah. which was also interesting because yeah. that job was reviewing marketing and advertising for CNN, the cartoon, the cartoon network, TNT, TBS, Turner sports, wow. And uh, the individual uh, Atlanta teams at the time. And so they would submit, uh, we want to do this sweepstakes yeah. or, you know, we want to do this ad. And I would review it uh, to make sure they weren't using anyone's image without their permission. Yeah. Um, you know, if they're using, it was a sweepstakes, they had to have the right rules. Yeah. No yeah. purchase necessary. Right. So I learned all about sweepstakes, contests, promotions, and that was probably not the best fit for the way my brain works. Okay. And I remember one time I walked into a convenience store with my wife and there was a Snickers bar that was advertising a, a sweepstakes on the wrapper. So I just picked it up and I said, oh, cat, look at this. They're excluding Puerto Rico. Isn't that interesting? And she said, that's not interesting at all. Yeah. You need to do something else. <laughs> that's not. That's not even close to interesting. So that's hilarious. And then, like my second year in that job, uh, the sports teams, like I remember the uh, the Atlanta Hawks, they submitted this contest, yeah. and uh, I reviewed it, and I said, "Sorry, you can't do it." And they said, "Well, that's ridiculous. Why?" The San Antonio Spurs did the exact same thing, and it would be well. The San Antonio Spurs are owned by a private individual. We are owned. At the time, it was AOL Time Warner. Oh. So our risk and exposure is a different thing. So I was definitely a corporate police yeah. man. Yeah, and you were slapping hands. Left I, right. I mean, I, and I didn't want to do that. I right. actually wanted to be them. I wanted to be the marketing person. Yep. I, and so after a while, I'd say, well, why are you using that color? And they would say, wait, aren't you supposed to be the lawyer looking at our stuff? Yeah. Why are you giving, why do you care about the creative? Yeah. And so then 9-11 happened. So that's what led us to San Antonio. Well, here's the interesting thing. So you look at your marketing today, which is, I mean, that's that's a, it's obvious that your marketing today comes from all of what you learned even back then. But, and I think about it because obviously we got to talk about real estate right now because real estate is insane, right? Yes. So moving into the real estate world, here you are, you come to San Antonio. Did you jump right into real estate right away? Well, we were just going to flip houses. Okay. So I actually just had my license with this company called the home team and the home team just had a fee for each transaction. And that was okay. But after the second flip, we realized that, well, my wife and my mom was working with us. Mm -hmm. They kind of, they had it all handled. It wasn't exactly clear what I was bringing to the table. (laughs) So you're like, what's what, my role here? <laughs> wasn't the first time that's happened, okay? But it's like, what am I bringing to the table? So right, it was, well, Jason, why don't you become a realtor? And I did not want to do that. I really resisted it. My mom, from the time I was 18, wanted me to get my real estate license because my mom had been a realtor in Dallas. Okay. And I got to tell you, I thought, I've got all this education. Yeah. I thought, I, this is not something I want to do. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of a crazy story, but you know, I've told, I've told Jay Cooper this story, but Mm -hmm. when I was going to transition into, you know, doing real estate, you know, with a brokerage, the only realtors that I had ever known were with Cooper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But at that time they had done a a merger with, I think it was ERA. ERA, That's right. Yep. And so I'd met with the manager and she was like, Hey, can't wait to bring you on board. And, but ERA requires this corporate like personality test or, you know, I'm sure like a disc or something like that. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't get it to load. And so it was like one or two weeks 
And I kept going back and saying, I, I don't know why I can't get this thing to load. So, okay, you know, can I, what's going to happen? Well, in those weeks, I did have, uh, one of our flip houses was closing. And a title company representative said, uh, said, well, why don't you go talk to Phyllis Browning? And I said, well, I know they're great, but I don't know anybody there. And she yeah. said, oh, well, I'll just go call the manager. And, you know, I just, I walked in and then, I mean, I walked out. I met Phyllis and, you know, I basically signed right there. Wow. Yeah. What a cool story. And then, I didn't know that story. And again, I didn't know if it was going to be for me. I was a little bit like, ah, what, how do you do this? What are you yeah. supposed to do? Yeah. But within two weeks, I really thought, wow, I should have been doing this since I was 18 years old. Yeah. Mom was right. She was right. Mom was right. So yep. it really was a good fit for all my experiences and education. And yes. yeah. So th to me, like you think about what you have to deal with when you were with uh, the WCW and you, the, the wrestlers, right? I mean, in terms of the clientele, now you're, you're representing, I mean, beautiful houses like this one right here. You're representing, I mean, the most luxurious houses in San Antonio. You're dealing with personalities. You're dealing with uh, people that uh, this property means a lot to them. Talk about what you learned and how you brought that to the real estate world with your clients. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, it was so helpful, my experiences with the pro wrestlers and just learning. You have to deliver to the client what they want. Mm. I literally will be at a listing appointment and I will ask something that seems like a dumb question, but how can I help you? And you think, well, you sell my house. That's how you can help me. But it's actually different, mm. different for different people. Uh, you know, it's how much, how fast, uh, how difficult will it be to show the house privacy? There's all these different factors and people always have different reasons and different things they actually want. They may start off saying, I want you to sell my house, but they will reveal through questions about yeah. what's really important to them in this process. So I did learn that through my work experience before real estate that, you know, you just, uh, everybody typically ask me, Tomas, how does, how does Jason do it? How does Deborah, how do they, how do they do it? And I, I you, typically, cause they say, I want to be a luxury agent. You know, that's, that's right. usually, and, and you get this question, I'm sure. And, and, and I always say the same thing. I said, treat every client like a luxury client, treat them all the same, take care of people, like find out what they need. That question is so important. A hundred percent. And it's, it can be very simple and you just ask it and usually just be quiet and have them start talking and you will learn things about how you can best serve them. I love uh, that. You mentioned Deborah. I will say that my family did use Deborah Janes as their realtor before I was a realtor. So I did learn a lot from Deborah, just the way yes. she carried herself and things like that. So shout yes. out, shout out to Deborah Janes. Shout out to Deborah Janes. Yeah. I would, we were just talking just uh, two days ago on the phone. Yeah, Deborah is awesome. Now, so now you're you're we're in this weird market. So let's talk about where we're at right now. Just can't we're 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 still in a pandemic, right? It's still COVID. It's still kind of weird times right now. But the market is on fire, and so I'm curious to get your take. Number one is what's fueling this? What is really fueling it? But number two. How long can this last at this pace with this luxury market in the, in, the in the sense of the luxury market? That's the billion dollar question. It has been, it used to be conventional wisdom that San Antonio's market would not escalate significantly. It would always, you know, probably have slow and steady growth until many, many more corporate jobs came here. Well, we've had a little bit of growth in corporate jobs, but really that is not what is fueling the market right now, uh, especially in, you know, the luxury market. So many people are moving from California. It is unbelievable. And some of that is COVID, which has definitely had people uh, examine their lives and, you know, what they want to do. And uh, for many people, uh, it means that they figured out they don't have to work in an office in the city, even where the company is located. They can work remotely from anywhere. Yeah. So we have so many people nationwide that are, they're just searching online for best places to live, most affordable places to live. And that is drawing them 
to San Antonio. Now, often, depending on where they're from, it might start with Austin, yeah. especially Los Angeles. So Los Angeles, looking at Austin, is definitely has been a big thing for a few years. But now that market is becoming a lot like Los Angeles. Yeah, the In terms pri- of price, right? In terms of price. Yeah. And so now we have uh, people really looking at San Antonio. This is interesting. I just learned the other day that for real estate searches online, there is a website where you can figure out where are they coming from for certain markets. Okay. Most metro areas have 90% plus of searches within their metro area. So it's people who are moving up, moving down. Okay. Okay. San Antonio is only 52% within our metro area. And of the other 48%, Los Angeles is the number one market with 15% of all searches of the other 48. Whoa. So more than the other Texas cities and are looking at San Antonio. That's right. Whoa. So it's San Antonio is the number one place where people are looking at San Antonio real estate, which makes sense. But then Los Angeles is number two. Wow. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And, yeah. and there's several reasons for it. I mean, it's the cost of living in California, lack of inventory, which yeah. guess what? We're starting to have that too, yeah, big yeah. time, but yeah. lack of inventory, uh, fires, earthquakes, just some of the lifestyle things. Yeah. Uh, you know, Texas is definitely looked at as a more friendly business environment as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's been really interesting how I've met families just in the last few weeks where, you know, they're, they're just on a hunt for the best place to live. It's not because of a job. Yeah. It's because they can live anywhere they want to. And San Antonio is on their radar. That's so cool. So we're, you know, houses right now, inventory is, is getting really scarce. What would you say to somebody that right now they they're thinking about listing their house and, and, and they're, they're like, they, they're flipping through the magazine. They're like, okay, you know what? Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for me to list. What would you say to a seller right now? It's the best time ever. Okay. And that's 100% true. But their question is, well, but where do I go? Yeah. And so we need to find them a house. We're not afraid to find them a rental. If someone feels like, Hey, I can cash out right now and that will make me feel really good. Mm. And yeah, I won't be afraid to go rent something and then be ready to strike if something else comes up. Now, on the flip side, I would also argue it's the best time to buy ever, which seems, how could it be both? Well, the answer is interest rates are still incredibly low. Okay. Okay. Well, what I believe is we think 2021 is crazy. In 2025, we're going to look back and say, we thought 2021 was crazy. Mm. So I still, there's nothing on the horizon that I think, you know, you can point to, to say, oh, that's going to make things drop. Yeah. Now, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think more inventory will come on the market, but I think that will just be back to nice, nice, good growth instead of just going straight up. Right. So I still think prices are going to increase. I feel like for the rest of this year, we're going to have inventory shortages Hmm. because there will be more houses coming on. Yeah. Really, uh, starting last week, more houses started to come on. Yeah. And the reason for that is, well, you know, April, May is the classic yeah. time more houses come on. Yeah. And as more people get vaccinated, more people are comfortable with people True. being in their house. Yeah. That's just a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. I've got two that are coming up where I've been talking with them since December. And the plan was as soon as they are safely vaccinated, and then, so for that, that date's May 1st. Wow. Okay. So okay. that's going to happen with other realtors too. Okay. Yep. So more inventory is going to come on, but more buyers are going to show up because this is also the time that yeah. school will get out. And, you know, if they're coming from California, that's in June. Yeah. And they may want to come and get situated before the next school year starts. So I expect through August, it'll be fairly crazy yeah. and a great a great time to sell. But if you want to get locked in at a price that will seem good five years from now, it'll probably be the best time to buy as well. So I I heard this, this was interesting. I was talking with uh, Kevin Crawford and uh, Kevin, his, his thought was, and I, and I, I I was like, you know what? I might, I might have to agree with that. His thought was we are at a new watermark in terms of pricing, right? Like, 2021 and 2020 uh, are, are kind of setting a new benchmark for where luxury prices, where San Antonio prices are going to be. 
And the chances are, going back to your point of best time to buy, we're probably not going to dip below these prices. Now, I know some people are overpaying. Like right now we have people going into, they're trying to get the listing and they're overpaying for it, right? Like going over list price. That's how right. do you how do you feel about that with with properties going over list price? Are we setting a new watermark um, in terms of pricing in San Antonio? Yes, it's absolutely the new watermark. But I expect we'll say the same thing in a year. Wow, I really do because I don't I don't see the migration of markets that are more expensive where people are bringing more money to San Antonio. I don't see that stopping because once the secret is out. Yeah. People learn that this is a beautiful place to live, and it is still relatively affordable. That That's the thing. San Antonio, the prices are going up a lot, but we're still not on the same level as the other major cities in our country. Yeah, yeah so true. And we just have to hope that this change ultimately is for the better. Yeah, yeah. And I have hopes that it, that it will be. Yeah. I do. I do, too. I do, too. Because Austin is is a place that was never meant for massive growth where san antonio is more spread out yeah it's true that is very true yeah this is uh, i'll show you this I, I, this is the new cover for austin take a look very at cool this. is that ridiculous 40 i think this was 39 million so oh, it part. sold right it sold yeah i read about it yeah unbelievably crazy house and you think okay austin i mean they've got water they've got all of this but you just mentioned something to me about somebody moving from Malibu. What, t t you shared that story. Share that again about pricing. Absolutely. So you've got, um, recently I've, I've known a couple of different buyers from Malibu, California, and one of them bought an almost park listing that I had, and their house burned down in the fires of Malibu. And then the regulations, uh, probably they weren't going to be able to rebuild for four to five years. Mm. And so they decided, let's go to, let's go to San Antonio. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, that, that $3.25 million mansion, you know, it was an incredible value from where they were coming from, wow. where they were coming from. I mean, it might be $50 million. Wow. Depending on the view. Yeah. And, and you, you've even had uh, some of your clients say that the pricing in Austin is there. It's almost starting to get to the point where they're comparable to, That's right. uh, to California. Yeah. So I've got a, a relative through marriage and she has a beautiful place in Encino. It probably will sell for $6 million and their last kid is off to college. So they're thinking, Hey, we should downsize and get into a more affordable place right. like Texas. And they said, okay, Austin is clearly the cool place to be. And it's maybe the most like Los Angeles, but when they're starting to look online for real estate, they can't find anything that would be less expensive than the home they're selling. Wow. And so I'm trying to get them, you know, San to Antonio. consider San Antonio because right. we are significantly yeah. uh, better priced than Austin, really Dallas or Houston for comparable areas in those cities. Yeah, I, I had a great conversation with, with Rick Cooper and his wife. We were we were at an event and this was this was last year, probably November time frame. And we were talking about the idea that if you look at the number of homes that Dallas sold over a million, I want to say it was like 2,000 over a million. And this was, um, and, and I, I have this report. I don't know if you, did you see this? I've, I've seen it, yeah. Okay, you know what I'm talking about, right? I Dallas do. was 2,000, Houston was 1,800, Austin was 1,400, San Antonio, drum roll please, 289. Yeah. <laughs> it was... <laughs> It was like 10%. Okay? I mean, nothing in comparison to the other places. No. Yeah. And for most of my 18-year career in this business, selling luxury homes, it's been difficult yeah. because it was a buyer's market. Supply and demand was in favor of the buyer. Yeah. We just didn't have uh, as much money here. Yeah. And so, you know, sellers have had to do anything. And this year... It has changed. It's changed I yeah. have noticed it where, you know, I've got one that's in Canyon Springs and Stone Oak, which has been a solid neighborhood of 600 to 750. Yeah. And I've got this beautiful modern house there that overlooks the golf course. Okay. And it's okay. It's going to be 1.25, maybe a little aggressive. Wow. We'll see. And multiple offers. Already. 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 Oh my goodness. This is, it's awesome.
And it, so it, we're, yeah. you know, the, the realtors who advertise in LHM, we're all talking to each other and trying to figure out, okay, so what's the line? Is it 5 million? Is it 4 million? Where, where do you see that significant drop off where supply and demand tells you it's still hard oh, to price, sell those price houses. wise price point exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. is it two, is it 2 uh, i don't think it's 2 i think really? it's i think it's 2.5 okay i think it's 2.5 that's, that's a good but yeah. i think you know you might get other opinions on that but i yeah. think it's 2.5 yeah um, i you know. i would agree based on what i can see just in the you know looking at mls that makes sense. Absolutely, but in the last couple of days, I mean, I've heard of one that I think is at six, which is under contract. Which is under contract. Yeah, that's so awesome for San Antonio. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely. So that's great for San Antonio. And we have a lot of gorgeous properties, so in a way, we deserve it. And yeah. it shouldn't be that if you build this beautiful house, that you know you'll never have enough people to buy it. So right. we're starting to really you know have demand. Yeah. But most of it is not coming from within San Antonio. No, do you think I've I've always had this thought in is San Antonio just more conservative? You know, Austin is a little bit more. I mean, it's almost like I mean, obviously they have way more tech. Way they've got it's like the Silicon Valley, right? The new Silicon Valley. And as Elon Musk said, it is the boomtown, right? He says in fifty years, Austin is going to be the most you know, dramatically changed boomtown. That's right. So, but is it, is it that San Antonio's a little bit more conservative when it comes to buying, you know, these more extravagant houses? Well, we haven't had the money in the past that mm. is in Austin, Houston, or Dallas. So that's one factor. And then I'd say the other one that keeps us a little sleepy is our relative remoteness that we're just very far South mm. And you, you get to Austin before you get here. Right. Uh, our airport has, you know, never been a major player as True. far as attracting corporations. So I think that has kept us sleepy. Yeah. And that will always probably be a little bit of a factor. Yeah. But the other thing is, an interesting conversation is, in these upcoming decades, will there be an Austin San Antonio metroplex mm. where it's like Austin is on the north side, San Antonio is the south side, but they have much more interconnectivity. I'm fascinated yeah. by that. Will it be high speed rail, which would mean you can work in Austin, but you live in San Antonio. We need it, Jason. We, we, we need, need more. We, we need, need more homes. Yeah. We need more affordable homes and both. You know, there's all of that going on. Yeah, I think it could be positive if it is planned in the right way. Well, and, and we got to get on that now. Like the Absolutely. planning for that is now, because really, I mean, you look at other cities like L.A., you look at other these major metropolitan areas. Uh, my wife and I were we were uh, staying in Beverly Hills and, and we were going to go to where Disney land in Anaheim yeah. in Anaheim and so you I'm thinking there I mean, you look at the map they're not that far apart what what is this like 20 miles I don't know exactly the distance it's not that far no it took almost four hours right so it was like three hours absolutely <laughs> it was torturous yeah. you know but if we don't figure this out now we could have that same issue going between Austin and San Antonio we don't need to we don't have to have that problem uh, no and we should I personally would love to see high-speed rail but you know yeah. I don't know I just don't know uh, if that will get off the ground. People have talked about it for quite a long time. Well, with Elon now in, in, in Austin, I do think, you know, he's got, what is what is his little thing called, the little tunnel? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I do. Hyperloop or yeah. something? Yeah, it's a Hyperloop, that's right. Yeah, the, I mean, that could be something that could it could be part of that, right? There's um, a chance. So, it, we look, I think we are we are in a unprecedented real estate time what advice dealing, I mean, because now we've got more agents jumping into the business on a, you know, on a daily basis, as you know. And so I'm curious, like what advice or, or, or would you say, okay, agent coming in, what, what are you telling them with what is in this circumstance, what's going on right now? What would you tell them? Well, I would absolutely have them get to know the veteran agents in their companies. If, if, you know, if yeah. people get together, that was a huge benefit to my career where I was the young newbie and I did meet everybody and I tried to get to know them and offered my services as a resource. So some of the experienced agents, they would just start referring me stuff and giving me stuff and saying, can you open this and making relationships? So that would definitely be smart. Move. Yeah. Something that, I, and it's just, it's respectful. People will like you and people will know you. It is hard to be known in this business with so many realtors today. Yeah. So if you can, 
kind of make friends with those experienced agents. And one day they'll probably decide to slow down or get out of the business. And you never know if they'll refer those clients to you. And then of course you have to work hard. Yeah. But then ethics, ethics. Yeah. Talk about that. That's a big deal. Yeah. It will. This is a business where telling the truth will actually make you money. Where I think, you know, and at least the perception has been that it was the opposite and maybe we didn't have the most honest profession. But what I found is the top producers, they do tell the truth. And it also helps, it helps with your personal anxiety. You're not worrying about, uh, you know, are they going to find this out? Always tell the truth. And I tell new agents many times the best answer is, I don't know, but I will find out. And I still say that today. Yeah. You can't know everything in this business. No. I learn stuff new every week. So you can't learn everything. So just, you know, learn whatever that is, which I usually think is marketing and negotiation. Yeah. If you're going to be a residential specialist, okay? It's marketing and negotiation and then just tell the truth. I love that. Marketing, negotiation, tell the truth. There you I, go. I mean, that, I, that, you know, I haven't heard it put that way, but that's brilliant for any new agent. Absolutely. That's gold. And, you know, for and some agents, they're going to be with companies that do the marketing for them. So if they're not as into that, you know, they can just kind of hand that off to, you know, a broker that will yeah. handle that as well. But I do think you said something which is critical. And, and, and I remember this at my time when I first got into real estate in 09 is knowing the people in your office, the veterans, and really making those connections. I, I That may be like number one, jo- obviously no real estate. You better know the market. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that goes without saying. But knowing who those players are and making those connections, how many deals have you done where you just picked up the phone and called one of the agents, you know, just said, hey, here's what I've got, and then the deal's done? I, I, I'm sure that's happened countless times. It happens all the time. And last year, uh, Judy Dalrymple, who's also been a great mentor to me, she just walks into my office and she just said, yeah, you know, I don't know what Scott and I are going to do. We're thinking about selling our house. We've got the lake house and, you know, and we're thinking about doing this for the summer. And I just thought, I've got a client for your house, Judy. It was the new uh, head of school at St. Mary's Hall. And it was a year ago and the market was tight then. And it was like, Oh, we weren't finding anything good. So, you know, I basically was able to get them in through Judy and then, and then COVID started happening. And that was one of my favorite transactions ever because, uh, each side, the Dalrymples and my client, they were so gracious throughout the, you know, the new experience of how do we deal with the pandemic that, you know, it just ended up being such a win for each side. But if I did not know Judy, that would never have happened. Right, 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 right. That's critical, right? It's the relationships. People, they, they, they underestimate the power of relationships in this business. 100%. And with all the new, the growth of uh, the number of realtors in our industry, you know, they come to these companies and they're in training classes. They meet their fellow newbies. And sometimes that's a comfortable place to be. And they're hanging out with that click where they really need to be meeting the experienced agents. And because and, the experienced agents tend to say, OK, are you going to be around in two years? True. You know, should I even invest time? You know, they don't necessarily introduce themselves. So we don't even know who they are. And I know this happens at any any large brokerage. Oh, yeah. So it's really important if you're new to introduce yourself. Yeah, that's it. I, I love that. So before we wrap up, talk, tell me about your team. I'm super excited about the Jason Glides group. You've got a team that has come together over the last probably what is about last year, right? Well, it started yeah July, July or so, and then we officially launched in September. Okay. So uh, something I always wanted was a dynamic team that was what I considered aligned with my personal values. So. Uh, where everybody would have a role and everybody would have the same work ethic and commitment to ethics um, and that we all got along. And so everybody on the team, so you've got Todd who has had his own law firm for years and years and he wanted to transition into doing a little bit more what I did years ago, except he was actually a lawyer that practiced for years and years in San Antonio. Okay. And he knows so many people and, you know, so he's been great. And 
with any attorneys that switch into real estate, I am always a little skeptical of work ethic because the attorney role and okay, you may have to go show 30 houses by SeaWorld on Saturday. Yeah. That's a whole different level. It's a different ball game. Yeah. So he just impressed me so much by showing me that, you know, he did have the drive and hustle. And then we have Kim Sweeney who, you know, right when I, um, uh, you know, I, I took some time off from Phyllis Browning. When I came back, Kim was there and, you know, she was just a superstar in the making. Everybody liked her. Yeah. You know, she has a degree from the Macomb School of Business at UT. Yeah. And then everybody has, you know, this background. She worked for Rackspace. Uh, Bennett Kennedy is my my newest agent. He's uh, he's in Bernie. He was uh, an executive with Mission Pharmacal for 20 years. Yep. And then Lauren, who is our operations manager, she was the manager at Tesla for the last three years. OK. And then Andrea, she's actually the one that has the most experience by far besides me. And she's been at Phyllis Browning the longest. So wow. everybody has their role. We're different ages. We're different religions. We're different ethnic, you know, ethnic groups. Yeah. I would assume that people check different boxes in the last presidential election. You know what? None of it matters yeah. because we all support each other. We are a small family. We have each other's backs and that makes this career great. Yeah. Yeah. There's money, which is an important facet, but if it's only about money, I can't see people having a long career. There's too much burnout yeah. without support and being able to bounce ideas off each other. And that's so what true. I wanted. So true. You know, I know Bennett, right? Did he tell you that? Uh, yeah. Y'all were in leadership, San we Antonio. LSA. Yeah. Yeah. We were in LSA and uh, we just had a function. I had to be about, I don't know, maybe a month ago, two months ago. I, it's weird with COVID. You lose track of time. Totally. Yeah, I cannot uh, but, agree more. But we just we were just talking about how you guys, you know, kind of kind of came on the team. I'm super pumped for him. Bennett is a great dude, and he's already killing yeah. it. And he does farm and ranch and residential, Can't and he's it. already so good at it. I'm That's really cool. proud. I'm proud of all of them. Yeah, and, and so wrapping this up, I'm 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 interested. What you know, outside of real estate, outside of just like what. What what are you what are you curious about right now? Like, what's something that you're learning about that you're like maybe somebody doesn't know that you're like you know I've been learning this and this is kind of interesting to me. Wow, that's a tough one. Okay, so you know I've been paying attention. My my son is a junior in high school and he's he's a really excellent aspiring filmmaker. So I've been paying attention to what he does and how he knows how to work all the equipment and write scripts and things like that. And so I'm really interested in that right now. Yeah. And so we're in a little bit trying to figure out where he's going to go to college and things like that. So, which is fun. It is fun, but That's we haven't been time. able to do college visits until, you know, really about now. And your, your daughter, Sasha, right? Sasha. Sasha's a what freshman. Grade? Freshman. Yeah. And what's her, what is she? Well, into? she's, she is an incredible student in a way that nobody in the glass or Clark family has ever been. I mean, she is, she's got something special academically wow. going on. And, you know, Kat and I don't know exactly where it came from. Right. <laughs> well, it's a combination of you two. Y'all, y'all two smart people. You well, went to UT. Yeah, on. but it's not about smart. It's about, you know, like not settling for less than, an, you know, an A plus. Oh, like so it's, she's got that mindset. Mindset. And she Whoa. has a fascinating brain to me where, if she ever hears of someone's birthday or see, sees it written, it doesn't matter how uh, close or yeah. distant that connection is to somebody. She yeah. remembers their birthday. Whoa. And I've read that there are people with brains that work that way and they can just, they memorize vast amounts of information quickly. And it's almost like a visual memory that, you know, and she's of course like her math ability is, crazy where yeah. I had to get a special exemption at my high school to graduate yeah. high school because yeah, yeah, I was yeah. so bad at I'm math. Right there with you. I'm right there with you. <laughs> so, that, that SAT kicked my butt, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where, uh, yeah, it's not going to be the same, That's but right. she didn't get that from us. What, so. What, so what is, what's her career field? What does she think she want to do? Oh gosh. I don't know yet. Yeah. I'm okay. not sure. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything that may, like she's curious about like, or she just loves learning period. I think she loves she love. she loves learning. She loves okay. she's definitely interested in what's going on in the world about, okay. you know, definitely about protests, social justice, what's yeah. happening in our world today. Yeah. And, you know, it, they have they've had two straight school years that have not been normal. Yeah. 
where, you know, you haven't had a full normal school year. And yeah. so it'll be really interesting to see, you know, when it gets back to quote unquote, quote normal, which I do believe yeah. will happen by next school year. Yeah. Um, you know, how does that change things? Yeah. Because I mean, she was new to St. Mary's hall this year. And so she hasn't spent a lot of in-person time with her classmates, her new classmates, but she has a excellent group of friends yeah. that, you know, she's gotten to know through zoom and a little bit of in-person. Are they in person right now? Are they, are yeah. they doing a little like a yeah. kind of hybrid? A lot no, of them do hybrid. Well, th- They've had a hybrid option, but yeah. they've been able to be in person for yeah. for quite a long time. Yeah, Enzo was the same way. He's at Saks, and they've yeah. been in person, which, like, look, I'm a former teacher. I, you know that. I think, I'm pretty sure you know that. I was a teacher. Yes. And when the, when, the, when the pandemic started and I became Mr. Martinez for my son, like, it was just like, he, I, would, I just remember the looks he gave me, like, no, no, you're not my teacher. Like, I, I have teachers, Dad. Like, you can't be my teacher. That was so hard to take. Well... <laughs> That was my degree. Jason. Yeah, and, and I, he still would. I was, I was hoping that would be something that you know he he could have just readily accepted because no. Zoom learning is not the same. No, it is hard. But maybe I mean I have known kids that could get stuff out of it. But yeah, it would have been nice to have dad supplement. It it was it was almost like you know how when you're you know when you're trying to teach your your child something and you you just you could just see it in their eyes where they're like nah he, he, I don't I don't want to hear this from you it's like coaching like you know try to coach him in certain things like he's getting into golf right now that's his thing that's his jam right now and so like his instructor teaches him it's like it's like everything he says is you know Rob shout out to Rob Myers he's amazing great coach for golf actually he's a St Mary's Hall coach is Rob he Myers yeah. okay he coaches their golf anyways so if I show him something it's like I don't know dad right I don't know. Oh, you know, did you did you do any PGA, Dad? Like, no. <laughs> so there's like, you know, but that's okay. I can I can deal with that. But listen, Jason, a lot of amazing things came out of today, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on TM3 Impact just to share a, a lot about your life, but also real estate. Any final notes about real estate that you'd want to share about what's going on in the market? Well, I I still think that San Antonio is uniquely positioned to just be a fantastic market, you know, for years to come. I don't see anything that's necessarily going to stop it because we're not like Las Vegas or Miami or Austin potentially where it's just going to hit way too high. And then there's a crash. Yeah. You know? And so I, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a privilege to be in this business. I'm really, I feel lucky every day that, you know, my, my journey led me to it. Yeah. And, you know, so me too. I'm lucky that it led me to this because I would have never thought we'd be at this point with Luxury Magazine. Ten years, Jason. And can you believe that? Ten years. I am super proud of you, by the way, because I can remember when it started and I didn't know if it would become a thing. I didn't know. And today it's the only magazine that I really see in my clients homes. That's it. So it's as far as print. Yeah it's really where I put my money to advertise because anything else would just be a shot in the dark where this actually works. I actually get business. I get listings from this magazine. I love it. Your magazine. So thank Thank you for doing that. Well, I appreciate that, Jason. And thank you for being on TM3 Impact. We're going to have this on YouTube. We're going to have it on iTunes, Spotify. So your kids get to play this back and hear this whole story. So oh gosh. Awesome. They're going to roast me for no, sure. They're, they're going to totally roast me. Well, they are in high school, so they have to, <laughs> they have to, they're good at it. Jason. Thanks again, my man. Great to see you. Thanks Tomas. Take care. Please.